Hi everyone, my name is Daniel Blackburn and today we're going to talk about macro and mesofauna. Okay, so this is a uh, uh, Lecture number seven of environmental soil microbiology, and today we're going to talk about macro and mesofauna. Macro and mesofauna are not my speciality, so uh, I guess I, I will do a, a poor job of explaining these topics, but I will, I will try my best. And the reason we are including this module in this uh, soil microbiology course is because of the importance that this macro and mesofauna will have in overall soil health and soil function. So we will explain this in a bit, okay? So overall, we come back to the same things, that these classifications of soil organisms by size. We have uh, uh, the microflora, which is consisting of bacteria, archaea, actinomycetes, fungi, and algae. Uh, and we have the fauna consisting in protozoa, nematodes, mites, columbula, earthworms, and other, yeah, and other ma macrofauna. The majority of the biomass in soils in general will be uh, corresponding to bacteria, unless in certain special cases where fungi will take over, and uh, especially in forest ecosystems where you have a lot of mycorrhiza association, and fungi will be dominant in those systems. But overall, in agricultural soils, you expect that bacteria will account for the majority of the number of cells and also for the majority of the biomass in, in grams per kilogram. Uh, nevertheless, today we're talking about the, the macro and mesofauna. These are big organisms. So in general, you will, they will account for a short number of individuals uh, per square meter per kilogram of soil. But Oh, they have an important function. Yeah, they have they have a very important function in the soil that we're going to talk about now. So the size of organisms, yeah, the, in the in the macrofauna, uh, it, it's important to say. I just discovered recently that the the the, uh, the the biodiversity atlas that makes a distinction between meso macrofauna and megafauna over uh, 11 millimeters. But uh, for this purpose of this course, we're just going to talk, refer to them as macrofauna. Um, but macrofauna would be accounting for small animals, uh, moles, prairie dogs, earthworms, uh, millipedes. Uh, the mesofauna would be uh, a little bit smaller uh, organisms, springtails and mites between 0 0.1 uh, uh, and, and uh, 2 millimeters. Uh, the microfauna. Uh, we will we will talk about below uh, one milli, uh, 0 0.1 millimeters. Sometimes nematodes with a single cell protozoans will uh, will be fitting on this category. Uh, and we have the flora uh, referring to plant roots, you know, which is still in the macro uh, size, but uh, they're not belonging to uh, king, kingdom and animalia. Um, and the microorganisms is the microflora. So when, when I ask about the microflora in exams, it's usually that the, the, that, that the students were mistaken, mistake that for plants and algae, but they will not think about fungi, bacteria, and actinomycetes. And the, the diversity of uh, these organisms in soil, we, we use different indexes uh, to measure this diversity. And the most common that is used is the Shannon Diversity Index. But the Shannon Diversity is just the, the, the sum of the relative proportion of each uh, taxa multiplied by the, by the natural logarithm of this relative proportion at the same time. So the more you have uh, of um, the number of taxa, the, the higher the number of taxa, the higher the Shannon Diversity will be. And the more distributed the number, this, this proportion will be among the taxa, the higher this channel diversity will be. So the channel diversity integrates these two concepts of um, 
the number of taxa as a, as a measurement of a diversity and how equally distributed these, ta these populations are among the taxa that are present. Uh, so this is what you will see this very common and there are many other uh, uh, diversity indexes and there are, uh, uh, you can make these Shannon indexes relative to one instead of doing, give, leave, uh, leaving it free as it is here. Uh, and there are many ways of measuring diversity, but I'm just giving you an example uh, as, uh, for this. Uh, while we're talking about diversity, just re-emphasizing that we expect that with higher diversity, you have a higher functional diversity and also a higher functional redundancy. Yeah, in these ecosystems, the higher the diversity of organisms, you increase the, the functions, the diversity of functions, and you increase the functional redundancy. The functional redundancy being that uh, uh, if you lose some of the taxa that perform that specific function in the soil, you will still have some others that will perform the same function and uh, therefore the soil will still uh, maintain that, that characteristic, that, that function. So we have species diversity, uh, which is the diversity of taxa that we have, and we have functional diversity, the capacity to use a wide variety of substrate and of, uh, uh, providing a wide variety of eco ecosystem services. We have the concept of functional redundancy, which is uh, res with respect that many organisms are able to carry the same function and therefore you have more resilience, more capacity of recovery and maintaining the function even if you have some event that will uh, reduce the population of, uh, 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 of some of these microbes that perform that function. Um, keystone species are the ones that we consider that, uh, that you cannot lose them. Maybe you have one single species that perform that function in that ecosystem, and if you lose that function, the f that is lost. If you lose that taxa, that, that species from that ecosystem, the function is lost. And uh, so it's the keystone species are the ones who you cannot afford to uh, lose that species on that, uh, that situation. And the, the global biodiversity is the, 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 uh, the genetic resource of soil organisms that you have. Yeah? Okay, there is a relationship that we need to emphasize a relationship between a function and diversity. So this is showing the data of uh, uh, soil systems in where you fumigate the, that soil system and you see what happens with the diversity uh, and what happens with the different functions in these soils. And as the diversity declines or the diversity is affected negatively by the fumigation, immediately you can say, see that there is a direct direct effect on the different functions. Yeah, here in the case, they are uh, looking in uh, methane oxidation and nitrate formation, but uh, uh, there is, regardless of which function it's named here on this slide, there is a direct relationship between diversity and function. When you lose diversity, you lose function, you lose functional diversity, in these soils. So what do you expect from these microbes? You expect that the microflora, meaning the, the, the fungi, bacteria, actinomycet, these will be uh, uh, responsible for the mineralization of, of nutrients, but also uh, there's a lot of carbon fixation from chemolithotrophs that are happening. Uh, 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 nutrient transformations in the soils which are not related to mineralization but uh, sometimes uh, oxidations or reduction processes that are happening in, on these soils. Uh, atmospheric fixation of, of not only carbon but of nitrogen. These are all functions of the, uh, the, the microflora. And uh, the, uh, these are highly related to uh, binding those aggregates and stabilizing those aggregates. The bacteria will uh, secrete gums uh, and, and polysaccharides that will stabilize the aggregates, where the actinomycetes 
and fungi will uh, surround these microaggregates and stabilize them using the hyphae and the threads from the from the um, actinomyces. Yeah? So microfauna, microfauna and mesofauna, and, um, micro, meso, and, 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 and macrofauna. These are mainly related to the regulation uh, of the, the population dynamics on these systems. What happens if you leave bacteria unchecked and fungi unchecked? What will happen is, what usually happens is that one species will be highly adapted for those conditions and that will, species will, will have a high dominance on the system. And when you have an equilibrated system with a, with a, a very um, diverse food web, these uh, micro meso and macrofauna they will feed on these bacteria and microbes and therefore the larger communities of these bacteria and fungi will be down regulated and therefore they will be equilibrated with uh, with the rest so these uh, 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 this uh, diversity in the sense that the the, the the distribution the percentage distribution between different species the dominance will go down uh, and then the equitability of this taxa will go up on this system. So this, there's a, a, a important function of these microbes of um, regulating the, the populations of the microflora. And the second big function that we have from this uh, microfauna and mesofauna is the function of re reducing the size of the, 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 the plant residue in order for the microflora to be able to decompose it. So this is the classical here on the bottom, the, 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 the tea bag or a litter bag uh, experiment where you can put some uh, plant residue inside bags with different mesh size. And as you do that, you can, uh, uh, bury the, those bags in the soil below the litter in, in forest, and then you can you can come back later on and see uh, check how much is the weight that is remaining on those bags. And by by doing that, you can estimate what is the rate of the decomposition that you have from that uh, from that organic matter that you placed inside the litter bag. And what you see here in this graphic is the the, the relationship between the size of the mesh and the rate of the decomposition. The bigger the size of the mesh, uh, it, it means that you, lo you can lose more uh, weight on this uh, litter bag experiment. Yeah? You can lose more weight in this litter bag. And that, what, that, is, uh, what is, that is telling us is because you have bigger size of the mesh, macro and mesofauna are able to come inside this mesh and chop down and, and carry microbes together with them and allow for the quicker uh, decomposition of this organic matter because of the, 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 the mesh size, the, the these, uh, internal content of these bags becomes available for the meso and macrofauna. And therefore that, that shows an increase a uh, loss of weight, which is reflecting the increased rate of decomposition of this material. So macro and mesofauna has, have these uh, two big uh, uh, functions on the systems the, the, uh, of chopping down the size of this uh, plant residue in soils. And at the same time, it is uh, able to regulate in, in uh, uh, the populations of the microflora and uh, influence them towards a higher uh, a species diversity. Okay, so this slide is just showing here a, a, a representation of uh, a distribution of, of organisms uh, on this, uh, on a possible soil. And you have that about 40% uh, 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 accounting for bacteria and actinomycetes, another 40% uh, uh, accounting for other microflora, so, such as fungi and algae. And then you may have a system where you have a, a, a good population of earthworms and other insects um, uh, and uh, macro and mesofauna. And this is what you expect in a population like this. And these, in, these macro and mesofauna are integral part of the soil health 
you cannot just count on soil microbes to uh, carry out all the functions in the soil. You need the macro and mesofauna to be able to uh, have an, a healthy soil. So the definition of soil health, or also uh, referred as soil quality, is defined as the continuated capacity of the soil to carry out its functions. Yeah? And the main function that we will have in this system is the sustained plant growth. There are a lot of uh, mechanisms and a lot of uh, smaller functions that are all related to creating an environment which is adequate for plant growth. So uh, the, all these organisms, they, they, they carry out different processes. And as a result of this, of this diversity, you have increased soil health and also was, uh, increased soil quality, uh, which reflects in a better environment for uh, plant growth, yeah? a better environment for plant growth. The next concept that we need to emphasize is soil resilience. Yeah, soil resilience is if you hurt that ecosystem by some extreme event. Let's say if you have, um, for example, a flood or if you have a high temperatures. Yeah, uh, what happens to the soil after this uh, extreme event goes away? How quick this environment recovers? So the quicker the recovery, the ability of this environment to recover from an extreme event, then you will have that, uh, that the soil has higher resilience. So if you hit the soil because you have a, a very hot day or you dry the soil, you might lose some of the functions temporarily, but the quicker the soil recovers that function, uh, this is a measure of the resilience of the soil, yeah, the resilience of this soil. Um, so this is related also to, to the diversity and function diversity of, of, of the soils. So the, the, the major groups that you have from um, uh, organisms, you, uh, as we already described this before, but here are some uh, illustrations of some of the uh, micro meso and macrofauna in these systems. So let's see what they are. Okay, next slide. So, okay, so uh, macrofauna here is um, illustrated as uh, microbes that are over two millimeters. Of course, there is on the, on the, the biodiversity atlas is also making the difference now for megafauna which in my uh, previous concept was over a ton, but now they are considering over 11 millimeters uh, uh, to be megafauna. Uh, the, here are some examples of the, the species that can correspond. This includes the, the snails, uh, earthworms, uh, ants, um, uh, and, and, and smaller animals like uh, uh, mice, moles, etc. Yeah. The, the macroflora, uh, you have uh, plants. The mesofauna, you will have something like mites, columbra, um, uh, small worms, pot worms, erichiedra worms. Um, uh, the, the, the microfauna will be corresponding to nematodes, rotifers, uh, amoeba, flagellates, uh, and, and uh, water bears. And uh, the microflora will be the microbes that we described on the on the the the, the previous lectures. Yeah. So this is just exam an example of a food web. Yeah, a food web uh, uh, representation. Whereas you have the autotrophs in the system, which are fixing carbon from the atmosphere. And after these autotrophs fix the carbon, there is a whole uh, a sequential uh, uh, decomposition of this, and the, 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 the primary decomposers serve as food for the predators in the next layers on that food web. So this food web is highly important for maintaining the, the, uh, an equilibrium, uh, a dynamic equilibrium of this diversity on soil systems. 
another uh, uh, representation of the soil food web where you have the organic debris uh, being decomposed directly by fungi, bacteria, actinomycetes, and then you have all the other organisms that are feeding on this uh, uh, microflora and serving as food for the next layer in this in this food web. Yeah. Uh, we, we should highlight some of the types of organisms that are uh, uh, important on the systems uh, and uh, some of them are earthworms, for example, insects, uh, centipedes, uh, millipedes. Isopods are highly important here in Oman. We have a lot of isopods and I think they are one of the main uh, uh, decomposers uh, that uh, serve that, uh, um, that purpose of chopping down a larger size organic matter for the microbes to be able to decompose. So isopods in Oman is, as I observed, more important even than earthworms. Earthworms are more important in wetter climates and more temperate climates. Um, there, you can find earthworms uh, in, in, in um, and, uh, uh, or orchards uh, and, and fruit trees, in uh, date palms, uh, um, but actually the majority of the agro ecosystems, you don't find uh, much, many earthworms in Oman, but you do find a lot of isopods everywhere. So earthworms, termites, they, they are good in uh, ingesting that, that, that grazing those microbes and, and uh, ingesting those uh, smaller fragments of organic matter. And um, they also a big soil, which is called a process called uh, bioturbation. And this mixing of the soil allows for uh, the higher mobility of microbes that are otherwise not able to move around in the soil and uh, th therefore accelerate the decomposition process. Uh, uh, these earthworms and termites and also some insects like ants, they are also responsible for reducing the compaction of the soil and opening macropores in these systems. Yeah? And these macropores, they create channels for uh, uh, water to permeate through the soil profile and therefore uh, create some, uh, also some channels of aeration in the soil systems. They act as microbial predators. And uh, uh, by doing that, by, by that, having that grazing activity, they reduce the dominant populations and allow for higher diversity. Uh, they have a, a very important function in, in recycling plant nutrients as heterotrophic uh, uh, organisms in this system. Let's talk about earthworms. Here are very extreme examples of very big earthworms. Nevertheless, the majority of the earthworms will be much smaller than that, up to five centimeters. Uh, but you can find some uh, quite big spe specimens of earthworms uh, in different parts of the world. Uh, this big one here is uh, 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 recently reported to be found in Ecuador. Uh, the, the, the top post is uh, Sir David Attenborough uh, in uh, Australia showing uh, these uh, giant earthworms that they have there. Earthworms are uh, animals uh, from the film Anelida and um, yeah. You, earthworms are one of the main, the most important organisms in temperate climates, in humid climates for our ecosystems, for forest ecosystems, or for any ecosystems within temperate climates. climates this is one of the most important organisms. They are uh, involved in accelerating the, 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 the organic matter decomposition in the, in the distribution of microbes throughout this pro, uh, soil profile. A presence of earthworms is usually a symptom of high fertility in a, a, um, a healthy soil, yeah? a healthy soil. Uh, you, there's a, uh, this number here is a little bit off the 7,000 species now. It's expected we have a, around 9,000 species worldwide. And uh, some of these species are dedicated or uh, adapted to work on the litter material in dungs or uh, uh, fresh organic matter. And these uh, are called epigeic worms. The endogeic worms are living on the first layer of the soil, tend to 
to 30 centimeters, which is usually the, the um, uh, um, the, the worms that you will normally find in agroecosystems or uh, endo, uh, epigeic and endogeic. Uh, but also you have some other worms that can have deep burrowing uh, uh, activities. And these also have some uh, other functions allowing for uh, a deep soil aeration and the movement of soil microbes. Yeah. So here is um, some of a, a, a chart that is uh, showing the colonization of earthworms in, uh, in an ecosystem after strip mining. So strip mining, you completely remove the soil, you mine the material, then you lay out the soil. But normally that soil is rather sterile. It's a mixture of topsoil and subsoil. And then the ecosystem needs to recover fully from that from that part. So um, what happens after strip mining is you can see how the ecosystem evolves to its from a completely uh, 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 infertile system up to um, an, a healthy ecosystem stabilized after many years. And uh, this study is uh, comparing when you add what earthworms. And, uh, and when you do not add, and what happens to those soils? So the earthworms are helping this ecosystem for a quick recovery. Uh, and in the, the soils that you do not add earthworms, uh, in, uh, or it, it takes a long time for these earthworms to recolonize from 20 to 30 years. So uh, this is just showing the importance of these organisms in accelerating the, the recovery and the resilience from different ecosystems. Uh, um, so this is comparing uh, the, the, the properties of the earthworm casts and the surrounding soils. Yeah, and you, you will have that, uh, that um, the fertility of the, the the nutrient content in the in the the earthworm cast is much much higher than you have in the surrounding soils because the earthworms are eating the microbes the microbial biomass and also eating the the very fine particulated organic matter and they're ingesting that together with the soil the properties of that cast are highly fertile and whenever you have those casts, these are is a good fertilizer for the surrounding plants. The, the table here on the bottom is showing the effect of different earthworms in the transport of uh, bacteria. So if when you have uh, 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 you if you add Pseudomonas fluorescence and you, you don't have uh, earthworms, the, the concentration of these microbes will be localized on the first layer of the soil. When you have a different species of uh, earthworms, what will happen is that as the earthworms uh, move through the soil and because they're uh, also um, uh, eating those microbes and, and secreting them in different parts of the soils, the movement and the distribution of these microbes are uh, being widely distributed throughout the soil profile because of the effect of the earthworm. So one of the main functions of the earthworms is not only to uh, uh, be a grazer of microbes, but also a carrier and a, a, a distributor of these microbes, a inoculator of microbes throughout the ecosystem. So when you have earthworms, uh, the, the microbes are being constantly carried around and inoculated in other areas. And so this helps a lot in the spatial distribution of these microbes vertically and horizontally at the same time. And that allows for uh, um, uh, a higher biodiversity and also a, a, a higher functional redundancy. So this is this graphic here is showing uh, the, the how much uh, the, the nitrogen distribution is in different parts of the ecosystem. When you do not have earthworms, because the litter takes so much more time to decompose, the nitrogen is locked 
on the litter material. But when you have earthworms, some of that nitrogen is lost to, to the atmosphere, and uh, but the majority of the nitrogen is a huge contribution and increase of uh, nitrogen forms in the soil. So what, what will uh, this means that you have a higher fertility and higher availability of nitrogen for plants. Uh, on the other hand, uh, if you have uh, a risk of erosion, you are losing litter, so you might have a higher erosion when you have uh, a good earthworm colonization on the system. So there is a trade-off. There is uh, increased nutrient cycling, but there is some speculation also that in some systems there is a higher risk of erosion if the earthworm populations are high, or even when you have invasive earthworms, it might be that you have a higher risk of erosion because you lose a big chunk of this uh, litter material. Uh, this is another table just showing uh, uh, different functions of, of different uh, types of, of uh, macro and mesofauna. I will not read this for you. Uh, you can uh, check on the slides later on. And uh, another slide just showing different representations of macro and mesofauna. And before we finish, I'm just going to talk a little bit about nematodes. Nematodes are highly important. And uh, they're, they're important because there, there's a high variety and high biomass of nematodes in different ecosystems. Uh, there are different sizes of nematodes also. But uh, they, they, they are in, uh, in, this, in this system affecting the, the, the function of these soils in different ways. You have uh, um, nematodes that are omnivorous that will eat uh, organic matter also. Some nematodes will be exclusively predaceous or micro, micro, microbivorous, uh, which they'll be, will, they'll, they'll be eating other microbes in the systems. Uh, we, you have that uh, some of the, the these uh, nematodes uh, will be parasitic, infesting roots, and um, and this is a, a big problem. There, there's some uh, plant diseases, uh, 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 and it's really hard to get rid of nematodes when you when you have plant, uh, uh, plant parasitic nematodes. Uh, there's a huge diversity of nematodes, and, and nematodes are highly important in that range uh, of the food web, which are in between the microbes and the macrofauna. So here is some, some, explanation, some uh, illustrations of how, how they look like on the microscope, the, the bacterivorous uh, um, nematodes, fungivorous, plant parasitic, and pred pre uh, predatory nematodes, how they look like on the microscope. Uh, and here's showing some uh, inf infection of uh, tomato roots with this uh, nematode. And looks like it's, a, it's a, 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 a legume root, but it's not a legume root. This is just a, a, a very severe infection of roots as a root disease. Yeah? Again, showing other uh, other nematodes inf infecting uh, different plants and, and affecting negatively these plants on this ecosystem. So it happens that when you have the, the, the type of nematodes in one system that affect one crop, the best thing you could do is just use some other crop because it's really hard to get rid of these uh, nematodes from this system. Some other mesofauna before we just finish this, this lecture. Uh, uh, we have columbola, uh, which is commonly called springtails. These are very common in composting, uh, cold composting in uh, wet climates and um, in pots, indoor pots also, you find a lot of springtails. In, in vermi vermicompost also, you see a lot, you can see them. Mites also, it's, they're very common. You can see a lot of mites in these, uh, in these systems. Um, so mites are re uh, very important in soils also, in agricultural soils, in forest soils. There's a huge diversity of mites also in these systems. And other that we can name here, we have uh, protozoa, uh, uh, ciliate, ciliate protozoa, uh, amoeba, and uh, flagellate protozoa which are less important for soils than they are for water systems, but nevertheless, 
in soil systems, they may play in humid, in humid environments, they may play a role also. That's all, that's all that I have for you today. I hope you enjoyed and I see you in the next lecture.